an audience, and he said things that they understood uh, to some degree, a lot of times in the parables, because he was probably standing there looking at a situation. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And Paul used a lot of phrases, too, uh, when he was writing to people uh, that they understood what was being said. And one of those phrases we're going to talk about this morning, and it's a spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption. The Roman people understood that. Paul was writing to the church in Rome. The Romans understood the spirit of adoption. They incorporated it from the Greek uh, mentality, the way they did things. And so when, when he said that word, immediately the people who were hearing that, reading it, they, they knew what he was talking about. Now, when we talk about the spirit of adoption, we may not necessarily understand the full concept of it. So we're going to look at it this morning. So Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Paul writes, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain this, and we're going to look into uh, the meaning of it, how it applies to us. <clears throat> but the Greek translation of adoption is different than what we understand today. And the Romans' concept of it as well. It really has nothing to do with bringing a person from outside of their family and bring them into our family. In our concept of adoption, we think of adoption as bringing like a baby into our family. We adopt them or a young child into our family. We adopt them and we raise them and we train them and we teach them certain things. But the word adoption here has to do with something, somebody being adopted into full status into the family. In other words, they were already grown up. They already knew how to talk. They already knew how to walk. And they were brought in as from full-grown adults into adoption. And the word, the New Testament word of adoption means being placed as an adult son. In the kingdom of God, we come into God's family by birth. The new birth. But the instant you're born into the family, God adopts you, positions you, as an adult in that family. In other words, a baby cannot walk, a baby cannot talk, a baby cannot make decisions, a baby cannot drop from the wealth of their family, but according to the scriptures, and according to what Paul is talking about here, when you come into the family of God, immediately you can be led by the Spirit, you can walk, immediately you can speak, you can say, Abba, Father, immediately you can, you can uh, begin to tap into the resources that God has available for you and to you, you all of a sudden immediately have status, immediately have privileges. A baby can't sign checks. A baby, uh, you know, can't, can't do certain things that an adult can, but the child of God by faith can draw on his spiritual wealth. Because as we're going to read here in a moment, he's an heir of God. He's a joint heir with Christ. He's born into the family of God. So from the time that you first accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to live a defeated life. You don't have to be beaten down. You don't have to wait until you achieve a certain position spiritually before you can begin to access the things and the resources God has for you. As soon as you are born into the family of God, you come into the family of God with all the wealth that can be given to you and all the blessings that he has for you. You don't have to wait for a certain point to grow to a certain level because it's yours. And Paul said you can call, you can call God Abba, Father, means Papa, Father, Daddy, Father. A slave was never allowed to use that terminology. Okay, now let's look at the next verse, verse 16. It says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, indeed, we, if we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now the suffering that Paul was talking about here was the suffering of being a Christian. Simply because you are born again makes you different. You have a higher moral standard. You believe that there's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Now, unfortunately, the world and most other religions in this world look at that as very narrow, that you are narrow-minded, that you are intolerant, and, uh, you know, they use all these things, uh, accusations against us, and so they, they reject us. They'll reject us because of our belief system. They don't like the fact that you have a moral standard. And so they'll reject you because of that. 
But through all of that, still, we have to learn something. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Is that because you've been adopted into the family of God, you have responsibilities laid upon you, you have certain privileges that you can access to, we have a certain destiny that God has laid out for us, and we have to achieve that in spite of the persecution or the suffering that we endure. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 3. He said, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So even though there is opposition to the believer, there's still a mandate to the believer from God to go forth and to operate what he wants us to operate in. And we've been talking about this for the last few weeks, and it is God has ordained that we rule and reign over all the powers of darkness that we occupy, that we sing that song, we thrive and not just survive, okay? That God has given us a mandate. He's given us a destiny. We've been adopted into his family in order to fulfill his purpose for our lives. And Paul said we're more than conquerors through Christ. Now I want to read one more scripture, Ephesians 2, verse 10. I want to read that out of the Amplified Bible. Do we have that in the Amplified on there? Um, faith? It, amplified? Okay. Let me read out the Amplified. It says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those things, those good works which he, God predestined, he planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. In other words, God has prepared and prearranged things so that you and I can live the good life as an adopted child of God. And if we understand that, that kind of puts a lot of things into different perspective for us. To realize God has placed you on this planet at this time to face whatever it is you have to face and whatever our society is facing. And he has pre-planned for us to walk in a certain way. God desires for us to fulfill his destiny for us. And uh, to understand that, we begin to feel how special we really are with the Father. How special we really are and how much he really loves us. And he has a purpose for your life and he has a purpose for my life. And he's prepared things for us and he wants us to rule and reign with him. And so we're going to talk this morning about being adopted, but adopted for a purpose, adopted to rule and reign with the Lord. In other words, when you go into an area, whatever area of that of, in your life that is, it might be in your home, it might be on the job, it might be in the workplace, in the marketplace. Wherever you go, you have a mandate from God to bring heaven into that place. You have a mandate from God to bring and change things to the good because this world is in chaos. And so God has prepared a path for us that we need to walk down and we need to bring heaven into the, the situation. We need to bring that which is out of alignment back into alignment. Now let me talk just a little bit more about this adoption. In the Roman adoption, there was really like two or three different stages to it. And the first stage was what they called the emancipation stage. And what would happen is that uh, a man that wanted to, uh, to adopt his son, for example, he would, he, would, uh, he would set his son out for adoption, and there was a scale, you know, like a, a weigh scale. And he would put so much on one side, and it would tip down like this. And if you wanted to adopt that son, you had to come in with so much money that would bring, bring the balances back to normal. Okay? So if you were the, the, the father that wanted to adopt the son, you'd walk in with the amount of money that was required, and you put it on this side, and you bring the, the scales to balance. And then you would declare that you wanted to adopt this son. But the, the natural father would look at that, and he would turn away, and he would say, well, I don't want to adopt my son. And then the man who was to adopt the son would say, but the price has been paid in full. And again, the natural father would turn away and he'd say, I don't want to adopt my son. And again, the man who wanted to do the adoption would say, but the price has been paid in full. And so the third time, the man that was adopting out his son would walk up and take the money and he'll walk away and then the son would go to be part of the family into the new, the new father. And then that would take him into the second stage. And the second stage was they would go down to the magistrate and then make all this legal. 
and they would present a legal case for the transference of ownership for the person who is being adopted. And the adopted person, that adopted person would lose all rights and all relationships to his former family, but yet he would gain all rights and all relationship to his new family. And that adopted person became an heir to his new father's person and his new father's possession. In other words, everything that his new father had was and now belong legally to the newly adopted son. And kind of a side note on this, in the adoption process that took place, if you were ever adopted, you can never be taken out of the will of the father. If you were born into the family, the father could, could excommunicate you. But if you were adopted, according to the Roman law, you were always the son. You can never be taken out of the will. So the old life of the adopted son would then be completely removed from the records. When you were born, for example, in Rome, they would take, they had a, a book that they, they had down in the courtroom, and, and, and they would open up that book, and when they opened up that book, they would record your name, and what family you belonged to, and the date that you were born. And it's called the Book of Citizenship. Now, when you were adopted, they would then open up that to the page where your name was when you were first born, and they would tear that page out and they would throw it away. It no longer existed. You no longer belonged to that family. Then they write in when you were born again. And they used the phrase born again. And they said that you are a new creation at that point. So you see some of the terminology that Paul used when he's talking to the different churches were terminologies that they understood when he talked about new creation. When Jesus even talked about the born again experience. That's something they understood. And then when Paul said the spirit of adoption, their minds all went back to this that took place, is that your name was taken out of the old citizenship book and it was placed in there as a new name. Now, if you can just transfer all that over into the spiritual realm, here's the truth. If you are born again, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says you are born again. You have the spirit of God living within you. Satan no longer is our father anymore. And if you just get that part into your head, it can change your entire life. Because our true birthday is not the day that we were born physically. Our true birthday is the day we were born again and Jesus came into our life. That the price truly has been paid in full through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that Satan has no legal authority over us anymore. And not only that, but you will never inherit the things that you did in your past life before you were saved. It's all been washed away. But now you inherit everything that God has available for you as his child. And you don't have to grow up to receive that. You are already brought in as a grown-up son of God or a daughter of God. So it's already yours. Our old life was completely erased. There's no trace of it. We belong to Jesus just as if we have never belonged to Jesus. Think about that. He didn't hold anything over us. It's like we've always been his child. So now, adopted to reign. When Jesus came, there was a divine power shift that took place. There's a shifting away from the Judaic sacrificing of bulls and goats to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who was to take away the sins of the world once, forever, throughout eternity. When Jesus came, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. The Bible says he gave to you and I eternal life. Jesus came and took back everything the devil has stolen from us. And his life proved that. And John writing about Jesus in 1 John 3, 8 said, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In the book of Acts, it talks about Jesus. It said that he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And apparently this carried right on down to the disciples as they were continuing the work of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 2, 5, Paul says this. He says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of spirit and power. He goes on in verse, chapter 4, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians. He says, The kingdom of God is not in word. The kingdom of God is in power. I read this scripture to you last week in Psalm 66, verse 1. The Bible says to make a joyful shout to God all the earth. 
sing out the honor of his name and make his praise glorious and say to God, now this is a declaration, say to God how awesome you are, are your works through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you and all the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. That's a declaration. So as an adopted son, daughter of God, we don't look at this world like it's going to beat us up or defeat us or it's got greater power. We look at this world as so, that as the word of God just says, says here, we make this declaration, all enemies will submit to God. No matter what the opposition, opposition is, all enemies will submit themselves to God and all the earth will worship you and they will sing praises to you because you are great and you are God. As Paul said, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. So as we're coming into a new year, 2016, we can say we're coming into a different level, perhaps an era of the church. And that is, it's not so much the word, but the power is needed. We've got the word. In fact, we know the word. When our kids were up here saying those memory verses, I would say 90% of you could have got up there and finished what they started saying because you knew the word. We got the word. We know the word. We're big on the word. But now we need the power. We need the spirit of God to make that word come alive within our hearts and our lives. We need the power to manifest sonship. And until power is displayed, release is not going to come. Jesus told a man in John chapter 3 that you had to be born again. Let's look at that. John 3, 1. So said, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Again, Jesus uses the word born again, the same words that were used in the adoption ceremony for the Romans and for the Greeks. So born again is not a religious thing. We use that as a cliche in the church many times, but it's actually entering into a family. We have to accept the fact that we have been adopted into a family. Now, several years ago, and we all got stories similar to this, I'm sure, but I've got two sons. And several years ago, one of my sons had decided he was going to go out into the world and he was experimenting with different drugs, and he started taking meth. And uh, he got very paranoid. If you know anybody that's ever taken meth, you know they get extremely paranoid. And he was seeing things that weren't there. There were people following him, he thought, that weren't following him. And, and he believed things because, you know, it's just the drugs working in his head. And this happened around Christmas time. And I remember when and we just came through Christmas. It always fresh my mind. But there's one Christmas time in our family anyway. On Christmas Eve, we get our children together and our grandchildren and our whole families together. And we open up packages. And we laugh and we have a good time. We talk about old times. We enjoy you know what's going on? We take pictures. I got a movie video that's going on all the time that everybody loves me doing. And, uh, you know, we just, just, we got food and all these things happening. It's just, it's family time, right? And this one particular Christmas time when we were doing this, I looked over and my son wasn't involved. He was standing over in the doorway and he just standing there looking, watching. Didn't come in, did not get involved, never laughed, never smiled, nothing. He just stood there through the whole thing and and, um, you know, that was years ago. He's passed all this now. But he told me later on that when he was standing there watching, he said all these thoughts were going into his mind that he could not be accepted into our family, that he shouldn't be accepted into our family, that why everybody else is having a good time, but he can't have a good time. And all these thoughts were going into his mind. Not only was it the, the drugs talking, but I believe the devil was telling him these things. And so he's just standing on the outside looking in, and when it was all over, he left. Well, again, that's been a long time ago, and, and things are better now, but I thought about that. I thought, you know, that's exactly what the devil does to people that come into church. When you get saved, you get born again, he'll have you just stand on the outside looking in and just say, well, I guess everybody else is being blessed, but it's not for me. Or well, somebody else is being touched, but it's not for me. God loves these people, but he can't love me. And again, it's the thoughts of the enemy that comes into a person's mind that tries to discourage you into believing you're not accepted. But I'm a father. And, and honestly, it does not matter what my children do. They'll always be my children. That's not going to change. 
And if I got a child that has a problem with drugs, more so I want him to come and feel like he's part of the family. And if you're dealing with the issues in your life and you're struggling with certain things and you're thinking, well, God is just not going to accept me. The Bible says if we, being evil, know how to give good things to our children, how much more does our Heavenly Father want to give good things to us? And so he's looking at you and he's saying, I want you to come in and enjoy the presence I have for you. Enjoy the good things I have for you. He wants to communicate with you. He doesn't want anybody standing on the sideline. He doesn't want anybody standing on the outside. He wants you just to come in and enjoy the privileges and the responsibility as a child of God. Jesus made a statement one time. He said, you are in this world, but you're not of this world. And that word there, world, is a word in the Greek cosmos. Cosmos. Cosmos is the uh, alignment of things or arrangement of things. The order of things. And the order of things in our world has been terribly, terribly distorted. When God created Adam and Eve and, and he brought them into the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. And when Satan saw that man was living in a perfect society, he said, I got to destroy this because he is all chaos. And he enters in, he deceives Eve, and Adam makes a, a choice and sins against God. And all of a sudden, all that beauty turned into chaos. In other words, God created heaven. He created heaven on earth for man. And said, you have dominion over the earth. Go out and subdue the earth. And man just turned all that over to somebody else. And that's to the devil. And what the devil has done is he's made chaos out of everything that's good in the cosmos. In this world, he's made chaos out of that. You might say, well, I don't know if it's so bad or not. Well, think about it. What's happening in our world? We've got lawlessness, we've got injustice, we have poverty, we have sickness and disease and premature death. There's disasters, there's toiling, there's sweating, trying to make ends meet. There's demonic forces that are trying to hold us down. There's dominions out there that are trying to destroy us. Our world, world is filled with hatred, filled with jealousy, and filled with racism. None of those things are in heaven. Not one of them. And Jesus, you know, they came to Jesus one time and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, after this man I pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's, again, the mandate's coming back to us. is saying, we need to change this earth that is in total chaos. We're in this world, but we come from a different mentality. We come from a different ideal. We come from a different source. We have a different morality. We have a different goal than what this world has. Because the goal of this world is, again, keep people in darkness and keep them in chaos. Whereas the children of light need to come and bring that light to them. So on earth as it is in heaven, he's chosen us to bring back kingdom attitude or kingdom order. And he has changed things. You have a superior attitude. The world knows bitterness and hatred. But God has placed love in your heart and service. You have a superior power working for you to bring everything that is out of alignment back into alignment with how God wants it to be. So we are here on this earth for purpose. It's like, like Mordecai told, uh, not Mordecai, like, uh, what was Esther's uncle's name? Mordecai, am I right? Yeah, Mordecai. Mordecai told Esther for such a time as this, for such a time as this, why are we here? we got purpose to bring that which is out of alignment back into alignment. And how can we do that? Because God has given us the ability. And it's understanding this next point we're going to look at, and that's righteousness. If you understand righteousness, that's a key to ruling and reigning with Christ. Righteousness is not a conduct of the way you act. That's holiness. Righteousness is a nature of God that's been imparted into your life. Paul uses the word imputed unto you. In other words, it's like a banking statement that if you put money in the bank you have you have money deposited into your account you know it's there because you can look at your banking account and you say there it is well righteousness has been placed into your heart into my heart when we come to the lord it's been set to our account not our righteousness but his and his righteousness changes everything his righteousness restores dominion it restores fellowship it restores peace it restores freedom it restores our faith and once we understand righteousness, and once righteousness comes into our heart, then faith begins to flow like a flood because we realize we have rights and we have a new family and we have a new authority. 
And what we have to do in this whole process of coming to church, reading our Bibles, praying, and all this, is that we're learning how to operate in what God has placed within our hearts. We're learning how to rule and how to reign. I talk more about this on Wednesday night, that we're anointed to reign. We're training to reign. We go through certain lessons in life where we learn how to rule and reign over the things of this world. But know that you have it in you right now. This world we live in does things a certain way. And it's almost completely opposite from the kingdom of God. But once you come into the family of God, you have a whole new standard by which you live in this society. And that new standard should distinguish you from anybody else. Has anybody ever accused you of being a Christian? I mean, not because you preach anything to them, but simply because you are. I was up in Alaska working one year, and um, we were taking a break. I was logging out there in, in Alaska, and I was taking a break, and this guy comes up, and he sits next to me. I didn't know him. I only worked with him two or three days. And he looks at me, and he says, uh, you're one of those Christians, aren't you? I never talked to the man before. I said, yeah, how do you know that? Oh, I, I can tell. I can tell. I can just tell by the way, way you, you act. The way we act should distinguish us from the world. How do we act that makes it all different? Let me tell you some of the things that make it different. The Bible says we don't grieve like other people grieve who have no hope. We have hope in Christ. So when bad things come into our life, we don't grieve over those things. The Bible says lift up your head and rejoice because God is about ready to do something great in your life. The Bible says you can have joy when other people are in sorrow. The Bible talks about how we can enjoy peace in a situation where it seems like there's turmoil. And, and that is demonstrating to the world that the God that is in you is greater than what is out there. We're bringing heaven into earth. And people need a touch of heaven in this age that we live in. Faith makes it so we can live on earth just like it is in heaven. Faith makes it. So that we don't have sickness and we don't have poverty and we don't have shame and we don't have guilt and we don't have disappointment and we don't have failure. You say, man, can we actually live like that? We can. We can. If we put our trust and our hope in God and nobody else. If we realize who we are and what God has done in our, in our hearts and our lives, how he has changed us, we can live that way. Honestly, I wake up every morning and it's a new day. And it's a good day. It's a good day until somebody tries to make it a bad day, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a good day. But even if somebody tries to make it a bad day, you bring heaven to this earth. You can change situations because of the Spirit of God that is inside of you. Now, none of this makes any sense to the natural person. But we're not trying to make sense. We're trying to make faith. We're trying to build faith. If you understand what God has done in your life, and you have been adopted into the family of God. And you understand that heaven is already there. You know we sing about heaven. We talk about heaven. But you can have heaven right here, right now. And if you just let people see how good your God is. And show them heaven on earth right now. That would be the greatest attraction that anybody could have. To the good things of the Lord. And that they may want this God as well. Rather than put you down and say, let me tell you. Tell me about this God that you serve. The Bible says that this is your inheritance. And it's written right in the adoption papers for you. You have been adopted to reign. What a change that can make in a person's life. Don't look at your old life anymore. Don't even be concerned about what the past is. And I, I would even encourage you, folks, don't, don't even exalt your old life. I've always had a problem with that. Is that people come out of deep sin and we bring them up on the platform and say, now tell us about how horrible your life was before you got saved. I don't necessarily want to hear how horrible your life was before you got saved. I know how bad mine was before I got saved. I want to hear how good your God is now that you've gotten saved. I'm not going to exalt the devil and his works. I want to exalt God and his works. And I want to tell you something. My God is good. And he's good all the time. And he has never, ever let me down. And he'll never let you down. He'll bless you if you allow him to. And you can walk with your head held high as a 
an adopted, anointed child of God if you will just allow yourself that truth to come into your spirit. God is greater than your addiction. God is greater than your problems. God is greater than anything you're facing in your life. God is bigger than any mountain you may be looking at. My God is greater, but you have to allow him to be God through you. God has called us for a purpose, for a purpose, for a destiny. And I believe that power is going to be released in 2016 like we've never experienced before. I believe it's going to happen to you wherever you're at, not just in church. You might be in your home, you might be on your job, you might be in the marketplace, you might be amongst your friends, you might be driving down the road, but power is going to be released in and through your life because we begin to understand who our God is, anointed to have dominion, adopted into his family. Is that good for you? It's good for me. It's good for me. As my wife mentioned earlier, if you're not saved, you're not adopted into the family. You see, you don't get adopted in the family because you're born in America. And you don't get adopted in the family because your parents are Christians or your grandparents are Christians. You get adopted in the family because you as an individual say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. When you repent of your sin and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned and allow Jesus to come and, and allow, allow the Lord to come in and just take the balance because the devil is saying, I've got your soul and Jesus comes in and he says, no, I paid for it in full. And he'll lie to you. The devil will say, no, it's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. But, but if the, the Father is still saying, Jesus is still saying, I paid for it in full. I paid for it in full. And the devil has to release his, his hands from you, relinquish his authority, and his hold from you, and you can come into a new kingdom. And if you've never done that, you know you can do that today. It's available to you today. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus. And accept him as your Savior. I want you to pray with me. Roseanne, would you come please to the piano? I want you to pray with me. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your goodness to us. You are good and you are great and you're good all the time. Savior, bless your people. Minister your life, your love, and your anointing to your people today. God, I pray that you touch our hearts and touch our minds, touch our souls. May someone be turned to you right now. Deal with our spirit. And break the bondages of Satan right now in the name of Jesus. Every stronghold will come down. Every stronghold will come down. And every opposition to the things of God will be laid aside. Savior, you rule and reign over all the earth. May you rule and reign us today. And while you're praying and your heads are bowed, let me ask a question. Truly God is Lord over all. But there's one area that he needs to be Lord over and that's you and me. He will not violate our will. He will not go against what we want done. If you want to serve the devil, you can serve the devil. But if you want to serve God, you have to say yes to him. Yes to Jesus. And allow him Christ paid to bring you into his family. Are you here this morning and you say, Pastor, I need, I need to get my life right with the Lord. I need to get my heart right with Jesus. And today I want to make a commitment unto him. Would you lift up your hand and say, that's me. I just need God to touch me today. I need the Lord to touch me today. I need him to touch me today. God bless you. Anybody else? Thank you, brother. God bless you. Good. In the name of Jesus. If you're unsure about this thing, let's make, a, make sure before we leave here today, let's just make sure today that our salvation is there. We're, we're secure in Christ. We're a part of his family. Anyone else real quick before we, before we move on?
pray for you and him. God is able. Okay, you lifted your hand. Do something for me. Come on up here. Let's real quickly agree together in prayer. We're going to believe God is going to touch you this morning. God's going to touch you this morning. I still like that shirt, brother. I don't want yours, but I want one like it. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. Come into my life right now. Make me clean. I confess all my sin. And I ask you to wash me in the blood of Jesus. I receive salvation right now. And I thank you for helping me and forgiving me. Jesus' name I praise you. Amen. Now let me pray with you. Father, I pray for those that are here. I ask God you touch them. Lord, we can confess our sins before you, but it takes the Holy Spirit to seal that into our hearts. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll seal. Lord, this, this grace, this wonderful, wonderful grace into our hearts. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we stand here anew and afresh and we are born into the kingdom we're born anew into you the old has passed away and all things become new a new creation i thank you god for doing that may growth and stability come to those that are here right now will you touch their families and minister your life to them and Lord, I pray that you make their path straight and show them what you have for them, oh God. Good things are in store. In Jesus' name. Good things are in store. Yes, we receive it. Hallelujah. We'll never know how much he loves us. whole situation Oma Jean is involved in. Give her strength. God, give her strength right now. Lord, give her wisdom and give her encouragement. And touch that man. Spirit, soul, and body touch him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your miracle power. And we give you the praise. come tonight at 5 o'clock. <laughs> this young gentleman right here is going to be speaking. Jason is going to preach to us tonight. He said he's been, pre he's been preparing like for two months on a message. I don't think I ever prepared too much on a message. If I prepared too much on a, two months on a message, it'd take me four hours to preach it. You might, you might do that. But no, you won't. <laughs> he spoke a couple months ago and did a great job. Tell you what, God has a call on his life and touch and God's got a call on several of you that are here he's, he's got a work for you and you know it and, and you begin to step out into it and I just want you to know that, that we we as a church and, and me as a pastor I'm here to help facilitate whatever destiny God has for you and whatever we can do to, to allow you to fulfill your your dream we're here for that anyway we're expecting good things tonight Jesus you need to come back and hear him preach amen Tyler, you said something about a video. You had a video. Are you want to play it? Oh, you did? Anybody see it? Hit it again. 
talks about the ministry that's coming up this month. It's in your bulletin. 22nd, I think, and 23rd of this month. Got some special guest speakers coming in. Come anyway, okay? <laughs> One of the ladies that's going to come and minister, they call her a prophet, but uh, she, she, years ago, and some of you might remember this, when Benny Hinn first started, he pastored a church down in Florida. Uh, she, was, she was on staff with him and uh, has really been with him through all these years, but she's one of the main speakers that's coming, her and her daughter some other people that honestly I don't know them Moses knows them Moses just to, again to help people out Moses came into the church and visited a revival service we had a few years back and I, I had heard Moses preach before and he's a very good preacher and when he was leaving I said Moses I said how's things going you still going to church and he said no I haven't been to church in six months I said are you working he said I haven't worked in over a year and I said let's get together and so I got together with him that, that week, and I said, you know what, you, you need to get back in church. Number one, you got a call of God on your life. you got a call of God on your life. You can't run from that. He says, I know that. I said, you're not going to church anymore. Come to our church, and, and I'll gradually introduce you back into the ministry, and, and I'll help you do anything I can to help you fulfill your destiny. And so Moses started coming to the church, and many of you were here through that time. That they stayed with us for a couple years, and the last year he was here, he preached every Sunday night. And Moses has since gone out and started his own work in Hillsboro. And uh, he was here a couple weeks back. And I think they have like 50 people in their church now. They're doing very good. Uh, and, but he knows these folks, you know, from wherever. And, and he came to me and he said, we want to have a joint service here. And uh, his church is coming. A couple other churches are coming. And you're invited. It's Friday night. And I, I think it's at 7. And it's like all day Saturday on the 22nd. All day Saturday. Tim, did you get that? It's on the 22nd. Just want to make, it's not next Saturday. It's Saturday after. And so, so um, there'll be speakers and there'll be food, lots of food. You know, we love food. We're Pentecostals. We, we don't smoke or drink, but we eat a lot. So in between every service, there'll be a break. There'll be lots of good food. And then Sunday morning, that, that, that Sunday morning, I think it's on the 23rd, um, the lady that I was talking about that was with Benny Hinn, is going to be with us and she'll be speaking. So anyway, we look forward to that, okay? Uh, be in prayer about it. Come expecting and God's going to bless. Let's stand. Let's stand. I'm glad you all made it through this last week with the horrible weather we had. I tell you, those of you who didn't make it last week, we had church anyway. And I was going to preach this message I just preached to you last week and the Holy Spirit came and I didn't even get into preaching. We just had some messages prophetic words that came forth and words of testimonies and encouragement and I love it when the Holy Spirit takes over like that and uh, we just sit back and let God anyway we had a wonderful time last week and if you couldn't make it we missed you I want you to know that let's pray together Father as we dismiss today I ask that you bless each one that's here and every family minister gratefully greatly in their life be gracious to them oh God give them good things this week in Jesus name we pray amen